OK, uh, let's make a start. The others, when they arrive, can, can move in for the back, from the back. Thank you very much indeed for coming along on this Saturday morning. Uh, very pleasant to see you here. Before we start, I'd like to make some acknowledgments, not just to our live streaming cameramen and assistants. It's very important that we, we spread our awareness as much as we can. But also to those people who've been helping in particular with the, the, the presentation. Two colleagues are with us today. The one who welcomed you at the back, Teresa, Teresa Gutenzohn, and our helper here, Henry, at the front. Without these two people, this would not happen. Uh, I, in a sense, have the easy part to, to perform. It's just to stand up and, and talk. So my first, thing, first duty is to make sure that you can all hear me. I see some, some nodding heads. That's good. Now, if I start to move around a bit, don't get alarmed. But if I come too close, you tell me to stop because of social distancing, right? OK, but you have to do it very, very clearly and obviously. Whoa, she says. OK, that's your obligation. I'll try not to, and the same over here. But I will move around a, a little bit. OK, my colleague Teresa and I uh, were part of the ceremony at Kranji War Cemetery on the 15th of February. We were both there laying wreaths for the people who were lost during the Japanese occupation. We identified, eventually, the inscription from Adnan Saidi, the Malay soldier who gave his life in, at Bukit Chandu. Uh, I think one of the more famous names uh, concerning the, the battle for Singapore. That was a very significant day for me, personally, not just to be there mem uh, to, to commemorate those people, my grandfather was killed during the war, not in Singapore, I should say, but he, did, he passed as a result of a particularly tragic set of events in England. There was something called the Blitz, and he was living and working in Exeter in the county of Devon, and he was on night duty, and his job was to look out for unnecessary lights on, also to look out for fires if there was anything happening. And his duty was, was to help out, put out the fire. Unfortunately, the building that he was in was struck directly during the Blitz. His body was not found, I believe, for seven or eight days. Such was the, the devastation. So that, uh, the, the ceremony at Kranji brought this home to me at a personal level. And I'm assuming that some of you have relatives, much older relatives, who are also uh, who are alive during the Japanese occupation. And they may have told you something about what they experienced and what their fathers and grandfathers went through. So I'm guessing that this is not a, a new sort of experience for you. Part of the, the ceremony at Kranji was laying of wreaths. I was uh, asked to represent Sports Singapore, and I laid a wreath as well. We were requested to include a message on our particular wreath. Now, I can't think of a very, very good message. Instead, I put down a short poem. And I don't know whether you will know this poem or not, but it is particularly meaningful, particularly the last line. And so I will, I will recite it now. Don't worry, it doesn't go on for too long. Kevin, you may know this one. Into my heart, an air that kills, from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires, what farms are those? That is the land of lost content. I see it shining plain. The happy highways where I went and cannot come again. And it's when I get to the last sentence that I start to choke up, because this is meaningful. I think when the poem was written, end of 19th century, it wasn't about the Japanese occupation, clearly. It may have been about lost childhood. It might have been about not returning home after fighting in the Boer War. I'm not sure. 
but it's relevant for those people who were in Singapore who maybe felt that they were not going to go home at some stage. So for me, that was uh, very, very meaningful. Anyway, it is not my intention to promote too much the horror of a, uh, an empire catastrophe or widespread human disaster in Singapore. The negative side of the occupation you will be well familiar with, I am sure. Neither am I going to downplay it. It will, it will emerge along the way. But my concern today is to talk about sport and hopefully a brighter side of life. And in the Singapore context during the war, for a relatively small proportion of the, of the population, sport was actually something very, very significant to them, something that maybe kept their heads up, their chins up, gave them something to enjoy. One of the characters I'm going to introduce to you a bit later on, when I asked him, what, you know, during the war, you're, you're playing football. Tell me something about it. And he said, well, we enjoyed it. And to enjoy something when you're under occupation, I think, is, is something tremendous. So we will, we will have a look at him a little bit later on. I want to make sure I don't block the screen for you. So th th this is what we're dealing with in commemoration of the 80th anniversary. Perhaps, Henry, you can, you can move on. A little bit of, of a word about who we are. Now, somebody said, how did I manage to keep the ball up in the air? Well, th this is part of my profession. My life is being in sport. So there isn't a string that's holding the ball up and I'm posing. I was actually, in a sense, in a sense juggling. Teresa on the right, who met you when, you when you came in. Henry is here with his nice red, red shirt. Our fourth member, hopefully, is watching uh, the live stream as it, as it comes through. So. We are a new division. You are pioneers, actually. You are the first adult population that we have spoken to. And our job is to spread the word, is to spread an awareness, not just about the Japanese occupation, but about the history and the evolution of sport in Singapore. That, that is our job. And we will talk to various groups. We will do some writing and, and so on. So this is part of what we do. Henry. So this one you can see. It's also over here. I won't take, take a lot of time with that. But what I do recommend that you do is have a look at the QR code so that you can see the exhibition, which is now online. This particular talk is based on that exhibition. It's not the complete exhibition. I'm abridging it. I'm picking out the, the, a few bits that I think are relatively important. But when you have the time, take your camera out, take your phone out, make it, take a picture of the, the QR code, and maybe have a look later. OK? So where do we start? An iconic picture, Percival, walking up to the Ford factory on Bukitima Road, about to surrender in 1942, 6.10 PM, if you're really very, very interested with all the other troops there. So this is, in, in a sense, one of the starting points. But what I have to do is step back a little bit in time so that you know what, what, what was there in the past. OK? So in, uh, just going back into the 1930s, that all, that's all. And I picked two particular examples which help explain or give you some idea of the context. The first one, which may or may not be surprising to you, is that women were involved in sport, but only a small proportion of the, of the population. And these were Eurasian girls who decided to start their own sports club in about 1929, 1930. Initially, it was the Goldburn Girls Club, and then it became the Girls Sports Club. And they, they had their location on Serangoon Road. So these were all Eurasian girls, 1930. They were the ones who started it for, for the ladies who are here now. If you wondered how long it took for the men to allow the women to participate, th this is not, not a bad uh, starting point. Over on the right-hand side, Henry, can you just press it one more time so we get the red oval coming up? This is E.W. Barker, 
Again, a name that most of you will be familiar with. Multiple sports were, were his interest. In this particular team, this was, this was football. He was an RI boy. He then went to Raffles College. Now, that's not Raffles Junior College. That's Raffles College, the equivalent of the university today, on book, likewise on Bukit Timah Road. So E.W. Barker is going to keep featuring along the way. And his role in this talk is very significant because he demonstrates the ideas of resilience and survival and achievement, administrative power, and so on, that emerged from the Japanese occupation. He's quite an important character. In the sporting sense, probably his most important role was being the president of the SNOC, the Singapore National Olympic Council. And he took on that role in 1970 and had it for about, about 20 years. So we'll be seeing him again uh, along, along the way. Very, very significant man. OK, the Olympic movement has proved to be very significant to sport in Singapore. And you may be wondering who the first Singaporean Olympians were. Now, there is some debate, there is some concern that we have, may not have acknowledged all those people who were born and lived in Singapore as Olympians. It's generally recognized that, number one, Chua Boon Lay was the first Singaporean Olympian. But he wasn't representing Singapore. He was representing China. In those days, Singapore did not have membership of the IOC. But he was able to participate for China. There's an interesting irony or contradiction. At this time, in the 1930s, administrators and coaches from China would come to Singapore to identify talented sportsmen to represent China. The irony is, of course, back in the 1990s, 2000s, administrators from Singapore would visit China to identify talented table tennis players, for example, so that they could come back here and represent Singapore. So there's been an interchange o over the years. So Chua Boon Lei normally thought of as the first one. But there were two others in the same team that nobody tends to recognize or remember. The, the second, the number three here, Kei Kui Liang, was also the national table tennis champion in Singapore. And so he's fully deserving of this particular status. The fourth one is different from the other three. And I'll explain briefly why. In the Olympic Games in 1936, the football competition was a straight knockout competition. Today, we have pools of four. Each team, each country plays against the other three. The best one in the pool moves on to the next round. In these days, it was straight knockout. So in the first game, China played against Great Britain. So I should wave the flag a little bit there. Actually, they weren't very good, but they, China played Great Britain. Great Britain won 2-0. So that meant that was the only game that they had the opportunity to play in. And these three, although they were in the squad, didn't get on. In those days, there was no such thing as substitutions. You couldn't bring somebody on at half time or after an injury and fulfill, keep up the 11-man appearance. So these three guys, unfortunately, never actually got their knees dirty, never fell over, never felt the sweat. The fourth one, however, the weightlifter, actually competed. And I think he came 14th or 15th in, in the weightlifting final in his category. That, in a sense, is the first ever performance by a Singaporean at the Olympic Games. Now, of course, things change. After the war, Singapore joined the Olympic movement and sent a team of one. And this is, this is the guy here, Lloyd Valberg. 
team of one, went to London in 1948. There was a team manager as well. And so he is officially the first Singaporean to represent Singapore as opposed to China. The others on this list, all of them, apart from Lloyd Valberg, represented China. So the China connection is really very, very significant in, in the early days. And it remains a, a significant linkage as well, uh, not just for table tennis players, but for, uh, for sports interest as a whole. I think a lot of people will watch the Winter Olympics and support a lot of the Chinese performers. Okay, so Wei Tianxia, we'll just have to say a little bit about this one here. He's a double Olympian, but he could have been a triple Olympian because in 1952, he was selected for the Formosa team. Uh, Chinese Taipei, Taiwan, same place, different name. He was actually selected for that team, but they didn't go to, uh, 52 is Helsinki. He didn't go to Helsinki uh, because of, there were there was po po uh, political dissent about who should represent China and that neither of the teams ended up going. So he could have been a triple Olympian, three different Olympic games, three different countries. Very, very strange. One final little anecdote about him, or well, about Wee Tien Siak and about Lloyd Valberg. I believe the only time in Olympic history in 1948 was uh, the situation where two athletes born and living in the same country carried the flag for two different nations. So Wei Tianxiak was the captain of the China team in 1948. He was the captain of the basketball team and he was the leader of the, the contingent that went into the opening ceremony at, at Wembley. I think it's a unique occurrence and Singapore achieved that, that unique occurrence. Okay, so I have to backtrack a little bit so that you know what happened. No Olympic Games during the war. They had to be cancelled, I guess, for, for obvious reasons. Cancelled or delayed. In the case of the, the Tokyo Games, which were going to be in 1940, they re-emerged in 1964. It took them a long time to be accepted back into the Olympic movement. The London Olympics, 44, were simply delayed by one cycle, so 1948. And it was a real trial for them to actually put it on, put the Olympic Games on. Okay. Right. Olympics during the war years? Possibly some prisoners of war were able to conduct their own form of the Olympic Games. And this example was in Poland, where these, these pr prisoners of war were able to be engaged in things like boxing, uh, so I think maybe some football as well, football on, on right, and handball and basketball. So th there's an important point about this slide, and that is that sport endures. Even in wartime, sport comes out for maybe a small proportion of the, of the, of the population. There's a very famous story, I don't know whether this is apocryphal or not, that during the First World War, when they were fighting in the trenches, one Christmas day, the guns went silent. The Englishmen, I believe it was them, English, maybe and Australians as well, they brought out a football into no man's land and invited their German opponents to come and join them for a game of football. This, it, amongst all the mud and the shells and the death and, and whatever, Sport was able to transcend some of those emotions that we associate with, for, with, with war. And I think it, it, to a degree it's actually true in Singapore as well. During the Japanese occupation, we, we're going to be talking, having a look at a number of sporting activities which were successfully held. I remember reading a book maybe 20 years ago. I don't know who wrote the book. And he said, during the Japanese occupation, there was no sport at all. And I'm thinking, either he's very, very young or he wasn't here at the time. He wasn't aware of things that, that were going on. Okay, let's, let's move on. 
So we're looking at early 1942, the cycling army of the Japanese. This is a, an iconic photograph in a way, but it doesn't really quite tell the whole truth. The Japanese army apparently was very, very well mobilized with tanks and trucks and so on. But this, this creates an interesting image to surprise and astound people about their invasion, traveling down Malaya to subsequently in, invade Singapore. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the military side of, the, of the, the Japanese occupation. I'm going to try and pitch in fairly soon to those elements of sport and to introduce some more of our characters. Okay. I said at the beginning, uh, Teresa and I, we went to the, the, the uh, wreath laying at, at Kranji. And these are, I think, now recognized as being two of Singapore's main war heroes. Limbo Seng and Lieutenant Adnan Saidi. For those of you who may not be aware, Limbo Seng is the grandfather of Lim Tech Yin, the CEO of this company here. He is my boss. He is the grandson of Limbo Seng. So again, there's a, there's a very, very interesting connection with sport. It's, it's somewhat divorced from the, the occupation itself. But, it, but it's still there. So the inscription on the cenotaph, they died that we might live. Very, very poignant. Now I'm going to show you another picture, which you may not expect to see. This was another hero or heroine of, of the war, Elizabeth Choi. She survived. The men didn't survive. She survived. And it's amazing that she actually did survive. She was captured tortured by the Japanese at the YMCA building. I believe, but I'm not 100% sure, uh, that they, in a sense, converted a squash court or a, a playing area. And they made people like, uh, like Elizabeth Choi kneel down for extended periods of time with lots of other men. They also devastated her, really, with uh, Torture, torture of different sorts, degradation in front of all, all the men. Uh, I leave it up to you to find out more of, the, more of the story. What makes it significant to me is another story associated with sport or games. I was fortunate enough to meet Elizabeth Choi in around about the year 2000. And I took my family, or my wife, and I think just two of my sons to visit her. And she would have been in her late 80s, early 90s at, at, at the time. She had some trouble with her feet at, the, at that time. She was uh, not particularly mobile, but in spirit, very, very alert, uh, very pleasant. Where does the sport come in? Because I don't as associate Elizabeth Choi with sporting activities. Well, uh, by the way, she used to live on Mackenzie Road. Not sure whether you know. It's parallel to Bukitima Road. She used to live, live there. And outside the front door of her house, suspended fairly high up on the wall, was a small plastic basketball ring. Now, I don't know whether she used it. I, I, I doubt it. But it was there. And it was there for people to use when they visited. So my second son, who can only have been about six or seven at the time, was desperately trying to get the ball into the hoop. It was very high up, and he was just a little boy at the time. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and he couldn't make it. And my wife and I are sort of talking to each other and saying, look, we cannot afford to stay any longer. We don't want to use up Elizabeth Choi's time with our son trying to score a very, very elusive basket. Elizabeth Choi intervened. She said, no, let him go. Let him try as hard as he wants to. It's OK. There is no problem for me. And so we carried on, we carried on. I'm not sure what my son learned from this, but I learned about the compassionate side of Elizabeth Choi's personality. You may know she became the principal of the Singapore School for the Blind. She was a member of the Legislative Council as well, very caring sort of person. So it's interesting how often sporting experiences creep into interactions with other members of society. Okay, 
within a few months of the Japanese occupation, a sporting association was created by the Japanese, the Shonan Sporting Association. And they had their headquarters at Jalambasar Stadium, just a, 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 a hut or a house just outside the main, main stadium. And they introduced competitions, in this case, in football, but also in, in hockey. Uh, I think they had some baseball that they organized as well, volleyball, basketball, a range of activities that the, the Singaporean population could join into uh, to help them stay healthy and fit, I guess. But it was also um, a propaganda tool as well. It was about power. It was about controlling the population. And so the Japanese th thought, if we organize these games, it will keep everybody uh, at an even keel. The healthy young men can divert their energy towards some, some games, some sport, and not cause us any trouble. I'm not going to go into Suk Ching. Uh, you, all of you, I'm sure, know about Suk Ching taking place during the first few weeks. This was subsequent to Suk Ching, when I think the, you know, the idea was, let's get the young men in particular involved. Later on, women were invited to join the association as well. Okay, so this was uh, one, of, one of the soccer teams there. Eventually, by the, uh, they started off, I think, with a membership of about 30 in the last months of 1942. By the end of the occupation, the numbers had got up close to 4,000. Now, that's not a huge proportion of the population by any means, but it's still significant. As the course of the occupation of the war changed, and Singapore became a target of Allied bombing, as the Japanese realized that things were going against them, the members of the sports association ended up not so much playing sport at all, but helping to clear away the rubble, tidy things up, and, even, and remove dead bodies from, from, the, uh, from the rubble to help the, the occupiers. Okay, so the Japanese idea, in a sense, can be encapsulated by the quote on the, on the right-hand side. Their approach to sport was different than the English. The, the, the colonial British, early on, had wanted to segregate racial groups, allow them to create their own sporting groups, that's fine and then compete against each other. The Japanese wanted the things to be a bit more harmonious, so different people of different races could play together in the same team. These were some of the activities that were important to them early on. Clearly, keeping everybody healthy and fit. Lots of good six-packs there that you can see. So the healthy fitness was, was important. So there were mass exercises, and there were sports carnivals. They also had the equivalent of an IPPT, a, ch a sort of a challenge. Now, I, I reckon when I was young, I would probably feel comfortable with that, except the last one. I was absolutely useless at pull-ups. I think I could manage three. So the, the young men in, in, uh, in Singapore during the war, they had, to, or they had to try and do at least four anyway. Other ones, not, not so difficult. Throwing a hand grenade is, is an interesting exercise. I've tried it with a German hand grenade, which is one of these elongated things, really quite heavy. And that's actually quite difficult to, to throw. But the ordinary hand-sized one, no, no problem at all. OK? Those of you familiar with the Padang, the, the two main clubs there, the SRC, and the SEC, one at either end, they were converted. The, the, the sporting clubs themselves were for the officer class of the Japanese army, not for the infantrymen, not, not for the grunts uh, you know, at the bottom. So they took possession of the main buildings at either end. And then periodically, they would have a series of games. And these were the games that they selected. Notice, no cricket cannot possibly have cricket because that's too British. So we have to have something else. So they chose baseball. And that took place at the SRC end of the, of the Padang. Other sports there, the football, hockey, volleyball, basketball. 
The football pitch is actually quite interesting. The, the current location of the SEC soccer pitch is approximately the same, and it's angled in the same direction. If you ever walk across the Padang, or you have a look, what you won't really notice is that there's actually a slope that runs down towards the, uh, let's say, in the direction of the sea. There's a slight slope, and that was the result of uh, land reclamation many, many years before the Japanese occupation. But it's still discernible. The reason I know, I used to play on that pitch every Friday night. And I, and I know we would always pick one particular end to start off with, because we knew two things. One, the sun will be shining in the eyes of the other side. So we want to, we want to play from the end where there's no sunshine. But we also knew that we're going to be confronted with this little bit of a slope. So if we were tired, it was better to be playing at the other end. So human nature is, is very interesting. But the idea of not being dazzled by the sun. We used to play at about half past five, quarter to six. And the sun would be going down behind the municipal buildings. So we always played in the other direction. And then the sun went down. We felt, we felt good. OK. Right. We come back to a squad. Uh, the, I indicated that there were competitions. And there were competitions. The main competitions were in soccer and in hockey. And eventually, there was even a tour up into Malaya for, for these particular teams. But this particular squad on the right, Pase Panjang Rovers. I'm going to move over to the other side. I won't block it. Because I want to introduce one of our main characters today. This young, fresh-faced looking fellow here is Chia Bun Leong. And he was, and I'm sure there are soccer players amongst you, will recognize that the front line represents the forward line. So you can tell what position he used to play. So there's the center forward. There's the right wing. There's the left wing. Chia Bun Leong was the inside left, a position favored by somebody like Bobby Charlton. Am I going back too far? I think some of you will remember the, will remember the name. So this is Bun Leong. And he was part of the, the, the winning side. The next slide will show you the table, I think. Now, I, I include it. Yes, Pastor Panjang. Undefeated. I include that slide for one particular reason, or two particular reasons. One, to show that there were a number of other teams playing. They were multiracial teams. But also to indicate that statistics are a very significant part of appreciating sport. When I was young, I, I did a newspaper round back in England. I had a bicycle. I had a huge bag full of newspapers. And I used to ride my bicycle around the housing estate. And I would deliver a newspaper to, to various houses. The important thing was I got a preview of the scores, of the results. And it's the statistical side of sport that I think really captured my imagination. Looking at the names of the players, the scores, the number of goals, or the cricket scores, this, this sort of thing. So an interest in sport is reinforced by the magic of numbers. And I think you know, even today, a lot of people will want to check the score before they know what, what actually happened in the game. Yeah. Right. It was mentioned in one of the earlier slides that they organized a special tour, a friendship tour, up into Malaya in 1943. This is part of a photograph of the hockey team and the soccer team that went up to Malaya. It's taken on the steps of what used to be the municipal buildings, now part of the, the art gallery. And I've just chosen a middle section so you can see two more important characters. On the left, Go Hood Kiet. In those days, they played around with the initials. So he was known as G.H. Kiet, not H.K. Go or Go H.K. There's a sort of an anglicization of names that, that took place. And he was very, very significant. He was put in charge of, of coordinating 
the, the efforts of the association. So this is the guy with the shorts, the long socks, and the knobbly knees. We're not actually sure what he played, if anything. But he was significant after the war as well. He became a president of the Swimming Association. He was involved with the Chinese Swimming Club. And he was on the, the, main, the first main committee of the Olympic Council that operated in Singapore. So his experiences during the war helped him at the, at the end of the war, and it helped him help others develop the sporting system. On the other side, maybe there's some debate about this fella as well, Mamoru Shinozaki, trying to look very cool, legs crossed, I'm in charge sort of thing. But I think there was a different side to his personality. Uh, in conversation with Cha Boon Leong, it turned out that he got on really pretty well with the members of the sports association. His main job was social welfare. And he was responsible for going off into Malaya to, uh, to Bahau to look after the, the movement of people across the causeway. But he was also closely associated with, with sport. He was a spy, apparently, before the war, was arrested and imprisoned for a while, then clearly released. But I don't think, I don't think of him as a bad guy. I think that he was compassionate. He created passes for many, many thousands of Singaporeans so that they could ex escape some of the hardships of the occupation. A bit like Schindler. You've heard of Schindler's List? He was the, sort of like the, the equivalent. The anecdote that Chia Boon Leong gave to me about Shinozaki was that very, very close to the actual surrender in 1945, he gathered everybody together, I think at Jalambasar Stadium, and he leaked the information that Japan was going to surrender. And I think if you're Japanese, that's probably a terrible thing to do, to tell those who, who, that you were in control of, we're actually going to finish this. This is, this is over. You'll be able to go home. I think for many Japanese, they would not consider doing that at all. But I don't know. Don't, don't quote me on this. Uh, to me, still really quite, quite significant what he did. So lots and lots of trophies, lots and lots of sticks. You'll notice the date on the ball. This is the, under the Japanese system. 2603, in other words, 1943. On this, this is the, one of the first years. Henry? Okay, uh, I'm not, I shan't use my, I'm going to use my finger. I'm going to introduce to you, or reintroduce one important person and tell you about a second one. So this is the Harlequins hockey team, successful uh, hockey team, the equivalent of the Pasipanjang Rovers. This was the best team in, in Singapore in hockey. But I'd like you to look at the two people at the back here. Now, it needs some confirmation, but I believe this is E.W. Barker. And I believe this fellow with the glasses was somebody who became an Olympian in 1956 in the hockey team. And his name is Percy Pennyfather. You may remember Annabelle. Penny father who passed away sadly uh, la last year. So this is her father, who was a, a, a major force in, in hockey. So this was the Harlequins team. The others, I'm sorry, I cannot identify. And if anybody can ever help me out identifying faces and names, I would be very, very delighted to, to find out. Some, some people have old photographs, and these sometimes emerge. For example, just last week, somebody sent me a photograph of the China football squad from 1936. And I was able to identify on this old picture, all the names were at the bottom. I was going able to confirm the presence of those three Singapore Olympians. Their pictures were there, their names were there. And for me, this, this is a wonderful discovery to, to find evidence that supports what you believed all, already. It's, it's a wonderful thought. Discoveries, perhaps that's a topic for, a, for another day. We're engaged at the moment in trying to discover 
as much as we can about the sporting system from the past. So, E.W. Barker, he's going to re-emerge again a little bit later on. And this is where, this is where he emerges, actually. Um, again, part of a story that you will be familiar with is the Death Railway from Thailand up to Burma, and thousands and thousands of uh, people, locals, not just prisoners of war, were sent up to work on this particular railway. The, the significance of E.W. Barker is this. He volunteered to go to the Death Railway. His, he has siblings in his family, and I think two of them were already married. It seemed to be like not the thing to do to allow them to go, so he volunteered to go up onto the, onto the railway. And part of his responsibility was to help with the medical condition of the people there. Now, clearly it was horrific, the, not just the working conditions, but the, the disease, the, the lack of fresh water, all these sorts of things. And so he played his part in helping his, uh, his mates along. There are a few anecdotes from his book, or the book that was written about him relatively recently. And because E.W. Barker has, does not have an obviously Chinese appearance, appearance, he's not Chinese, he's Eurasian, it was easy for some of the Japanese to mistake him for British from a distance if you like. And apparently, E.W. Barker went walking in the jungle one day near, near the railway, and he was intercepted by a Japanese soldier who escorted him smartly back into the camp, where he took E.W. Barker to see the officer in charge. And the officer in charge, apparently, with a very precise Oxford accent, said, the fool thinks that you're British and let him go. This, this is a nice touch of humor from a Japanese soldier. Impeccable Oxford accent. This fool thinks you're British. And we know, of course, that you're not. We know that you're Singaporean. So, what else was happening? The prisoners of war in Singapore at Changi, they had quite a set of sporting activities that they could resort to, not just to pass the time, but there's a very important psychological element to participating there. There are three, I think, three groups of prisoner of war prisoners there. There were the British, the Australians, and a few extras. I think Dutch was, was the other group. And of course, the significant thing in a sporting context is that pre-existing rivalries between those types of groups re-emerged within the, within the prison. There has always been, uh, let's call it a friendly rivalry between Australia and England anyway. And it's borne out in the Ashes cricket, which uh, Australia absolutely demolished England recently, a few, few months ago. It, when, when the rugby comes along, it's the same thing. They really want to beat each other. So in Changi prison, this rivalry re-emerged. Re but there was a different, there's another element to it, not just the, the, the nationalistic part. It was also about personal identity. It was about demonstrating to the people around you that you were still healthy, that you were still fit, that you could still promote your masculinity, if you like, on the sporting field. You couldn't do it with a gun in your hand, so you found somewhere, some other way to, to promote that side of your identi identity. I believe there were 50,000 people incarcerated. Now, I'm going to do something very cheeky, and it's not fair, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you have questions about sportsmen in Changi, we actually have the author of the Bible on sport in Changi, and he's with us here today. Kevin, sorry to do this to you. Maybe, maybe later, if anybody has questions, and he's in much better position to, you know, to pinpoint some of, some of the details for you. Okay, you go on. Now, this is, this is cheating, actually. Mount Emily swimming pool was opened in the 1930s. It remained open during the war, during the occupation. It was uh, very unfair to women. 
Women were only allowed to go in, I think, a couple of days a week and at a particular time of the day. It was a male-oriented sort of recreational exercise. I'm cheating here because this picture was probably taken in about 1971, but it gives you an idea of what the Mount Emily pool looked like. If you go up to Mount Emily today, all you will see is an extent of grass and a few trees, but it's very clear where the pool was. I believe there may still be a concrete set of steps leading up to that level, which would have been used by people paying to go in. On the right, we have Bahau settlement. Remember, Shinozaki was responsible for moving people over there to start up a new settlement to help them grow appropriate food for consumption. I don't think it really worked particularly well. Uh, this was one of the other things. There is very little that I can think of or remember that has a sporting relationship attached to it. Okay. Again, something that there is very little evidence of today, but there is some, some evidence. The Japanese built a memorial, a shrine to the fallen dead during the occupation. I believe there was also a second memorial and it was created by the Australian contingent of the army that was there. Not the British, I believe the, the Australian. And, though, and both of those, or the evidence of both of those memorials is now no longer there. The hill remains and there's a set of steps that leads up from a car park up to the top. If you want a little bit of extra exercise and you're, you know, you're feeling like immersing yourself in the Chureto, the Japanese memorial shrine. Okay. So we're getting close to the end. And, so, and I'm getting up close to the end of my use of time. The, the occupation ended, clearly, 1945. Great celebrations. I think that, I believe the local population had very mixed feelings though. Clearly they had survived the Japanese occupation and all the horror that is implied by, by that phrase. And so the, there was a certain element of freedom. But they found themselves stuck in a situation where there was still lots of disease, unemployment, uh, huge difficulties. At the back of their minds, they're also thinking, the British let us down. This is going to be a stimulus towards self-government towards eventually towards in independence. Where does sport fit in? Well, thank goodness for the British, actually, after all. They helped to create the first Olympic Council in 1947, which was when uh, our friend Chia Boon Leong uh, was able to go to the Olympic Games. And I believe we have three or four more slides which show you a little bit about Chia Boon Leong. Here he is. Wonderful shorts, huh? So this, is Char this picture of Bun Leong was taken, I think, towards the end of last year. Right at the very end, there's another one of him just a week or so ago, which you may have seen in the, in the newspapers. So anyway, this was the description. He had a nickname, Twinkle Toes. I, like, I choose to believe, all right, uh, and this is very unfair, I choose to believe that Fandi Ahmad would fit well into the category that was created by Chia Boon Leong. Not the other way around. I think in their time, they were the dominant players, similar, similar type of players. So he was known as Twinkle Toes, his ability to, to deceive and run around players, to play penetrating passes, to score lots and lots of goals. And uh, he was described as such by a coach, an English coach who was visiting with a Swedish team. He said, this guy's twinkle, watch him, twinkle toes. He goes around everybody. Okay, next one. We, I think sometimes we overestimate what professional footballers do today. I know during COVID times, it's difficult for them to complete their playing schedules. Uh, many, many games, one after the other. But in 1947, Lianhua, which was a team made up of Chinese players from the region, not just from Singapore, but from Malaya, from Penang, Malacca, and so on, 
They went on an extended tour. So, they had survived the war. They had been able to play a little bit. They were in good enough condition to go and challenge similar teams from Bangkok, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Manila. They went on a 43-day tour and they played 23 games. A game every other day, on tour. That's amazing. One thing helped them. They didn't play 90-minute games, 45 minutes. They didn't play that. Usually, they played 60-minute games, 30 minutes each way. But when they went to Shanghai, where the weather was much colder, they discovered they had to play a 90-minute game. And this was one of the three games that they lost. They only lost three games out of 23, and they lost 4-2. But the star of the game was our friend, Boon Leong, who was mobbed at the end of the match by the crowd. They wanted to get close to him. He didn't score, but he must have had a, few, you know, a couple of assists at least. But he, he, was, he demonstrated his twinkle toe ability to the Chinese fans, and they adored him. They wanted to, to get in close to congratulate him. So his performance in Shanghai and around the region was good enough for him to be selected by China to go to the Olympic Games the following year. And I've said a little bit about that all, already. Henry? Singapore's perhaps most successful period in the Malaya Cup or the Malaysia Cup was in the early 1950s. And again, Bun Leong was part of that team. He claims that he retired in 1955. I think he's underplaying himself. I think he carried on playing in 56, although not in the Malaya Cup. Singapore won the Malaya Cup, 50, 51, 52, 55, and they, were all, they also reached every final as well. And that didn't happen during independent Singapore times. That from memory, Singapore won in 65, the year of independence. Also, I think, 70, 77, 84, and 94, the, la the last one. So they, didn't, they never had the sort of winning streak that the Singapore team had in the 1950s. Now, some of the names will, will mean things to you, some won't. The ones that are interesting to me, this guy here, Pop Lim, Lim Yong Liang. He was a Malaya Cup player back before the war, highly influential in the soccer sphere, and very articulate, very astute in his comments about sport in, in Singapore. And he was responsible for giving a lot of advice to new governments, new organizations on how sports should be run. Um, this fellow here, Chu Chi Seng, goalkeeper, he was in the Olympic team uh, in, for, in 48 as well. Awang Bakar, probably one of the best center forwards ever. I don't know enough about the others to tell you something sensible, but I think it's a very nice, nice picture anyway. Some of the names will mean something to you, I'm sure. OK, so this is, I think, our last slide for the presentation. This was taken at Boon Leong's home. Uh, and one of the pictures that was taken at that time featured in the newspaper, I think, last, last weekend. What interests me, and it's sort of, in a sense, to finish on a, a lighter note, is that even the soccer balls understand what social distancing means. <laughs> so anyway, lots of media, media attention for him, and I think that's great. Now, I, I believe we have some more slides which ask people to... Which was the next one? Oh, OK. Well, this, this is just a sort of a reflection on the, the, the ceremony that we went to the other day. This is the poem. I recited. I won't do it again. The author is a man called A.E. Houseman, Eng Englishman. And I tell you, it makes me choke up when I get to the, last, to the last line. And I think it's appropriate for those, maybe some of those prisoners of war who are in Changi, 
who were not sure that they would ever get back to see those blue remembered hills. Uh, there are lots of other poems and, uh, and statements as well. Uh, okay, next one. Right, if you're interested in my book, I mean, this is the embarrassing part. This is the embarrassing part, uh, advertising my book. There are, there are some copies here. I'm not allowed to sell them to you on site, but if you're interested, uh, by all means have a look around. I'm sure we can come to some sort of arrangement later on. Okay, so the, the QR code there for the book. And I believe there's one more QR code, is that right? Thanks very much. The, I don't know whether you have, a trouble, have trouble with this word feedback. I do. I, when I did my master's degree in England many years ago, we didn't talk about feedback. We talked about knowledge of performance and knowledge of results. But today, this is the buzzword, give feedback. And it ha sometimes it has a negative connotation. So please, could you have a go at the QR code? It's a very, very brief summary of questions, and I'd be very grateful if you could fill it out. While you're doing that, you should take this opportunity. Do you have any questions? Is there anything that uh, has sort of really piqued your interest that you want to find out about? And if I can't answer, I'll go to Clev Kevin Blackburn. And he didn't know I was going to say that. He's keeping his head down. <laughs> I think we took the timings, yeah. not, not too bad. Actually. Sure. Sorry, I'm going to walk down and I'm going to stand over there, and then I won't. What happened to all those athletes that represented China? What happened to them? Yes. Did they stay in Singapore or they leave? Or no? Actually, quite an interesting question. For some of them, those who weren't really recognized initially, they returned to China to serve in the Sino Japanese War, which was the late 1930s. So they didn't necessarily stay here. Uh, Boon Lei, yes, he stayed. I believe the other two, one of them, I think, went back to Hong Kong. The other went back to um, maybe Shanghai. And one of them became an, uh, an aircraft pilot. And they fought in that particular, you know, the late, the late 30s. So they're, they're, I mean, the, what is regularly acknowledged is that it doesn't matter where you're born, if you're Chinese, Chinese is, China is the, is the motherland. So some of them would have, would have returned. Not all of them, as far as I'm aware, survived that war, nor the Second World War. Okay? So only Boon Lay stayed like that? That's the only one? He, he was the one of those three that we definitely know stayed. He, he ran a chicken stall at Lao Passat. Wow. You, know, you know Lao Passat? Okay, so he, that was his business. Once he finished, uh, after, after the war, he created his own business. But he was also very much involved with, with soccer circles, of helping out with coaching, uh, trying to, you know, to generate more motivation for the players. So that was, that was his job. Okay. Very Any other questions? Kevin, no, make it a difficult one, please. Um, if you contrast sport under the British and then sport under the Japanese, yes. what happened in the, the post-war period? Did it go back to the 1930s uh, or did things change because the Japanese had the, this kind of multi-racial view yeah. of uh, sporting competition? Very interesting question. I could go on for quite a long time about that. There was a big debate after the war. Do we go back to the traditional approach that was set by, by the English, or do we look for something different? The Japanese influence was that the healthy lifestyle type of thing in a more autocratic setting was actually going to start to take over. But certainly in the period up until self-government in 59, it was still very, very English. It was after Mr. Lee Kuan Yew came along and decided that he wanted to, to open up all the sporting clubs to, to the, all the different races 
that was one important step in that direction. And then the other one was the idea of sport for all and the healthy lifestyle and, and so on. Some people have argued that the Japanese influence was actually very, very strong. There was a residual impact of what they were doing during the, the occupation, which lingered for longer and made it easier to have the, uh, more of a sport for all, uh, I'm not going to use the word autocratic, but you know, a different type of approach. So the English approach remained in part because if you're a member of the Indian Association or the Salon Sports Club or whatever, you probably don't actually want to go and join the cricket club anyway because you're happy with the people that you're, that you're with. You speak the same language. There's nothing worse than being on a soccer field and you can't communicate because your teammates don't speak your language. You know, people tend to get ignored or overlooked or, you know, whatever. So there's no definitive answer to your, to your question, but I think the gradual transition towards what we have today start, probably started during the Japanese occupation. <laughs> yeah. Did they, did they stay multiracial? Yes, they did, as far, as far as I'm aware, but I don't know how long they lasted because this, this was one of the reversals. It was going to be easier at the end of the war to go back and say, okay, you, you're SRC now, aren't you? You're, you're Asian. Go and represent them. We don't need the Harlequins so much. We don't need the lazy lads so much. We had something established in the past. So I, I think there, w there was a slight reversal. But this, uh, I'm not sure I can say it was perpetuated throughout. Okay. Sorry, I'm not doing my social distance. You didn't tell me to go away. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, can I say thank you very much again for being with us today. I hope you found it somewhat illuminating, hopefully entertaining a little bit, and also to try and give a slightly, a, an additional slant on what the Japanese occupation meant. Horror, undoubtedly, tragedy, undoubtedly, but also the human spirit was there coming through as portrayed through sport. And you think about it, we do that today. Some of you will be watching the Community Shield maybe, the sailors and the uh, Albirex, I think it is. This is a, a, one of those things about reinforcing identity. People associate with the team that they support, and that's very important. So, my, my thanks to the, to the streaming film for, uh, team at the back, to Teresa and Henry. Oh, Teresa's at the back here. My thanks to them, my thanks to you, and do have a good weekend. Thank you. We would like to thank the Singapore Sports Museum. Uh, for those who have not been here before, we invite you to enjoy the exhibits uh, and the artifacts uh, within the museum. Do take your time uh, to enjoy the museum. Thank you again and have a great weekend.